Needless to say, many things in St Helens have changed over the last hundred years or so. But thanks to a handful of Cineum video enthusiasts, we can take a fascinating look back at the St Helens of old. Their unique footage captures many views of everyday life in the town and also some of the memorable events of the 20th century. From scenes in a local coal mine in 1910, the Queen's visit in 1954, to St Helens' centenary celebrations in 1968. Coal mining is now a part of St Helens' history, but it's impossible to ignore its lasting legacy on the landscape and its place in the district's heritage. At the height of the industry, there were more than 35 separate collieries in the St Helens area. There were around 6,000 men employed at the Sutton Pits alone and tens of thousands of local families depended on coal mining for their livelihood. As this remarkable film taken in 1910 shows, the mining life was a tough one. If we'd visited this pit 70 years earlier, we might well have been a little shocked at the sight of women and children as young as four working alongside the men for up to 12 hours a day. The public became aware of the situation in the collieries in 1838 after an accident at Husker Colliery in Barnsley. A stream overflowed into the ventilation shaft, causing the death of 11 girls aged from 8 to 16 and 15 boys between 9 and 12. The disaster came to the attention of Queen Victoria, who ordered an inquiry into the conditions in the coal mines. Victorian society was outraged to discover that children as young as 5 or 6 worked as trappers opening and closing ventilation doors down the mine before becoming hurriers, pushing and pulling, heavy coal tubs, often knee-deep in water. What really offended Victoria morals though was the revelation that women and girls wore trousers and often worked bare-chested in the presence of men. Such iniquitous practices had to be stopped and in 1842 the government passed the Mines Act which banned girls and boys under 10 from working underground. Mind you, there was still plenty of hard labour for them at the surface and when this film was made, girls and young women were still a common sight at the collieries. Their main jobs included moving the heavy coal tubs from the pit head to the sorting screens and hand sorting and grading the coal. It wasn't unusual for whole families to work at the same pit, all contributing their hard earned wages to the household budget.
and falling stars that seem to cry. Your baby doesn't want you anymore. By the 1960s, conditions in the pit were just a little more civilised. Much of the back-breaking underground work was now mechanised, but this was a mixed blessing. Machines were replacing men in the pits, and the workforce was shrinking. But an even more serious threat to St Helens' mining industry was emerging. Wise men in Westminster decided that the deep mining of coal was no longer economical. Despite expert reports that there were still 40 years worth of winnable coal reserves, one by one the pits were closed. When Sutton Manor Colliery finally closed its gates in May 1991, coal mining in the immediate St Helens area came to an end, leaving only memories and a proud heritage. But you'll see lonely sunsets after all. It's over, it's over, it's over. It's St Helens' other major industry was, of course, the manufacture of glass. This rare film shows George V and Queen Mary visiting Pilkington's Cowley Hill Works in 1913. This was the most modern glassworks of the age, and the VIP guests were provided with a suitably high-tech method of viewing the factory. Glassmaking began in St Helens in 1773, after the opening of the Sankey Canal made it easier to bring raw materials in and carry the finished products away. In 1827, Peter Greenall and William and Richard Pilkington opened the St Helens Crown Glass Company in Grove Street. Pilkington's went on to become the largest glass manufacturer in the world and made the name of St Helens synonymous with glass. By the 1940s, production of sheet glass was highly mechanised, but as this film shows, traditional skills still had a part to play.
When this film was made in the 1950s, Beecham's had been a feature in St Helens for almost a century. Thomas Beecham began his working life as a shepherd in rural Oxfordshire, but proved more adept at growing medicinal herbs. He became a travelling peddler of herbal cures, in particular a laxative, which he called Beecham's Pills. His journeys led him to Wigan, where he became a grocer cum druggist, and thence, in 1859, to St Helens. He built a small factory in Westfield Street, the first in the country, solely for the production of medicines. The business prospered, and in 1887, Beecham opened a new factory, which became a St Helens landmark. The factory closed in 1994, ending 135 years of Beecham's in St Helens. Parades and processions have always played an important part in the tradition of the St Helens district. This collection of clips of various parades in Prescott in the 1930s shows the enthusiasm with which local people embraced these occasions and also provides a few glimpses of the town some 80 years ago. Crucial to the success of any parade in this part of the country was, of course, the brass band. No self-respecting event was complete without one. At one time, there were 16 brass bands in the St Helens area, and an annual brass band contest was held at Denton's Green. Local carnival parades have always changed with the times and by the late 1930s they began to take on a military feel, revealing the concerns among the local population that war was looming. The appearance of a Hitler look-alike at this 1937 event shows the fears people felt at the growing menace in Germany. The early 1960s was the dawn of the Space Age, which was reflected in some of the carnival floats. St Helens offered a warm welcome to everyone, even from Mars. One of the biggest occasions on the social calendar in many Northwest communities, certainly for the children, was the traditional Whitsuntide walk. Boys and girls, either in their Sunday best or in costume, walked in solemn procession behind the Rose Queen, who'd been crowned for that year's event. Walking days, or whip walks as they became known, sprang out of the Sunday school movement. This quote reveals their admirable goal. Children who worked under wretched conditions during the week in the manufactories were on Sunday allowed to run wild and free from all restraint. It's thought the earliest wit walks took place in Manchester at the start of the 19th century and soon spread to other Lancashire towns. 
However hard up the family was, it was a matter of great pride to the mothers to make sure their child was properly turned out. This account of a walk in 1895 shows the sheer scale of the occasion. Shortly after noon, the school children began to assemble, and by half past one, about 900 boys and girls, followed by the Children of Mary, Society of St. Aloysius, League of the Cross, Sacred Heart, Catholic Benefit Society, making a total of about 1,100, wended their way to Mr. Willis's field at St. Helen's Junction which he had kindly lent for the occasion. After about a thousand children had been substantially fed, various sports and entertainments were indulged in. The after-walk entertainment often included a fun fair. In some districts, it was customary for the spectators watching the procession to give money to children they knew, and the kids knew exactly where to spend it. Many of the social activities in St Helens had strong connections with local industry. Pilkingtons, for example, sponsored all manner of events, from dog shows and fruit and flower shows, children's sports days, cricket and bowls matches, to some rather more frivolous pastimes. But the most lavish event of all was laid on by the miners, for action would be frowned upon today the beauty contest to elect this year's coal queen. Eventually a proud but slightly bedraggled Miss Lancashire Miners Gala 1960s crowned. The prize is £50 and a week's bed and breakfast holiday in Morecambe. When the citizens of St Helens weren't parading through the streets or doing other fun things, many of them could be found on a Saturday afternoon at Knowsley Road, home of the Saints for 120 years until it closed in 2010. St Helens Rugby Football Club was founded on the 19th of November 1873 at the Fleece Hotel by William Douglas Herman. They played their first ever game on the 31st of January 1874, under union rules, against Liverpool Royal Infirmary. In 1895, they were one of 22 northern clubs that broke away from the Rugby Football Union and established their own competition with different rules. St Helens' first match of the new code was an 8-3 win at home to Rochdale, in front of 3,000 spectators. The scorer of the Saints' first ever try in Rugby League was Bob Doherty. 
St Helens contested the first ever Rugby League Challenge Cup final in 1897. They lost 10-3 to Batley and it was another 59 years before they finally managed to lift the trophy. Halifax in the hoop jerseys kick off against St Helens in the Rugby League Cup final at Wembley. St Helens from Half Roads has the ball, he back heels to McIntyre, back to Corrales but Pilty stops him. Halifax attacking. Nearly stopped, but not quite. Out to Lynch, Lynch to Palmer, and Palmer's down. Wilkinson passes to Henderson, who dodges McIntyre and starts to run. But a Frank Carlton's there and brings him down. The ball's loose, Parsons grabs it, but Daniels tackles him. Half time and still no score. In the second half, St. Helens put on the pressure. Aurelius is pulled down, but passes to Carlton, and he's down too. Skipper Prescott makes a few yards. From a scrum down, St. Helens get the ball away. Left winger Carlton races for the line. Halifax try to stop him, but he's made it. Scrum half Rhodes takes the kick and converts by inches. In under parcels, on the roads, now St. Helens are really moving. Still caught to Greenall. He tries to run, but he's cornered and passes to Llewellyn, and Llewellyn scores. Once again, Rhodes converts, and St. Helens are leading 10-0. Rhodes struggled to break through again, but he's stopped, and so is Daniels. Penalty to Halifax just saves them from a whitewashing by two points. A few minutes to go, and Corelius passes to Prescott, who bulldozes through for a wonderful try. No luck with the conversion, but the cup is St. Helens by a 13-2 victory. So who cares about a couple of points? Skipper Prescott is hoisted aloft by his team, jubilant after their first ever Wembley triumph. One thing sure to attract the cameras was a visit from a member of the royal family. On the 3rd of April 1950, the streets of St Helens were awash with flags, bunting and excited residents to welcome Princess Margaret to town. St Helens is next to greet the princess. The lads and lasses of Lancashire turn out to give a never-to-be-forgotten welcome. Visiting St. Helens' famed glassworks, the princess sees the furnaces, some of which have been alight continuously for four years. They produce, in a temperature of 1500 degrees centigrade, the molten liquid essential for the glassmaker. The flags were out again three years later, in June 1953, as St. Helens joined in the joyous celebrations for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. This is how the St. Helens star described the preparations for the big day. 
as Coronation Day draws near, flags bunting and loyal banners, emblems and signs are giving the town a gay and festive appearance. Corporation buses have been decorated and individual householders and streets are displaying flags of all sizes and admirable window schemes. But there was something very different about this particular occasion. When it was announced that the coronation would be shown on television, it sparked a rush to rent one of those newfangled TV sets. On the 22nd of June 1953, St Helens came to a standstill, as all over town, people crammed into front rooms to gaze in awe at the images from London. The television age had arrived, and life would never quite be the same. But we hadn't forgotten how to celebrate, and once the broadcast was over, it was outside for a good old traditional street party. The following year, the people of St Helens had the opportunity to greet the young Queen in person. On the 25th of October 1954, she and her dashing husband honoured the town with a fleeting visit. In 1829, the eyes of the engineering world were cast towards the little village of Rainhill to witness a piece of railway history. Five steam locomotives took part in trials on a one-mile stretch of track to find an engine reliable enough to operate on the soon-to-open Manchester and Liverpool Railway. The winner was Robert Stevenson's Rocket, which established the basic design for steam locomotives for more than a century to come. In 1979, railway enthusiasts converged on Rainhill again to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the famous Rainhill Trials. Famous engines from across the country gathered in sidings near Bold Colliery in preparation for the highlight of the celebrations, a great cavalcade of steam.
Our final piece of film takes us back to the 27th of July 1968. The people of St Helens have taken to the streets again, this time to celebrate the centenary of the municipal charter that elevated the town to the status of a borough. This is how the St Helens newspaper originally broke the news of the Charter back in 1868. The long talked of Charter incorporation for St Helens has at last been granted. A communication from Her Majesty's Privy Council was received in St Helens on Sunday morning. This news which conveys the fact that St Helens has now been admitted to take its proper rank and place among the important towns and cities of the empire was received with much satisfaction by the great bulk of the inhabitants. The fact that the charter had been granted was announced by placards extensively posted throughout the people. Many things may have changed in St Helens, but, thanks to our amateur cameramen, at least some aspects of its past won't be entirely forgotten. Once upon a time there was a tavern Where we used to raise a glass or two Remember how we laughed away the hours Think of all
The event in the shaping of the 1960s occurred at the very beginning of the decade. National service, the system that had obliged Britain's young men to complete two years of military service, had finally been scrapped. This gave thousands of 18-year-olds the chance to enjoy life, just as they were coming of age. The decade began joyously for Britain with a royal wedding. With my body, On May 6, 1960, my body, Princess Margaret married Anthony Armstrong Jones, a society ID photographer at Westminster Abbey, and the newsreel cameras captured the event. The marriage charmed the whole nation. It was a perfect way to start a new decade. The couple received the blessing of the Archbishop. And now, London and the world awaits their first appearance as man and wife. to the Britannia and the gay chorus of the sea. Such was a May wedding in London which touched the hearts of people far and wide, not only for its solemn vows and circumstance, not only for the pomp of beauty and romance, but for the happiness that sailed on the evening tide. 
It was not only Britain which celebrated the remarkable achievement of Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. In 1961, he made the first manned space flight and gave the Russians an early lead in the space race. Gagarin was given a hero's welcome when he returned to Earth. All Russia's just wild about Yuri Gagarin, first man to conquer space. In his four and a half ton nose cone, he orbited once and was back again 108 minutes after takeoff. Major Gagarin was landing in Moscow and Mr. K was with Yuri's wife and parents to greet him. What a hero was this young cosmonaut, unknown one day, the next, the most publicized man in the world. A bear hug from Khrushchev expressed the feelings of all the nation. In a triumphal cavalcade, Gagarin was driven into Moscow, sitting between his wife and Khrushchev. What the whole of Russia felt, the people of Moscow put into their cheers for hero number one of the Soviet Union, Yuri Gagarin. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The communist menace became a terrifying reality in 1962, when the world went to the very brink of nuclear war. The Russians placed nuclear weapons in Cuba, close to mainland America. A tenseness was unmistakable. Both people and government expected an American invasion. Students helped to man the anti-aircraft guns. Not very impressive looking weapons against the sort of planes the US could have sent over if invasion had been the plan. At last the Cubans, army and people, knew that Russian rocket sites had been installed and that more were on the way before President Kennedy imposed the blockade. Needless to say, it was still easy to fan anti-American feeling, playing on the supposed threat of invasion. Cool heads in a volatile situation eventually saw sense, and a nuclear showdown was narrowly avoided. After Kennedy called the Russian bluff, even the Cubans sensed that Castro suspected he had backed the wrong horse. The rockets will be dismantled and taken away. Carnaby Streets never imagined years ago it would be a fashion center, and it's worlds away from the Dorchester. It's the street where all the withered boys go for the expensive outfits the chicks dig. No use having a good leg if the trousers aren't cut to show it. No matter how handsome a mod may be, the right gear gives him real class. No wonder Carnaby Street's doing big business. They then fall behind in the fashion race. When Mary Quant invades new realms of fashion, bright young girls are interested, and so is the national press. As the outcome of two years' hard work, Mary has perfected the very thing the new generation had been hoping for. Boots and shoes that are distinctive, comfortable, washable, and nearly indestructible. Mary believes that footwear should fit like a glove. Wear the latest kind when you're young, and in later life, you'll never complain that your feet are killing you. That sounds like a wonderful future, viewed from any angle. In the early 60s, the British press and public were still fascinated by the royal children. Princess Anne's first day at Benedict School was a major news story. The headmistress, Miss Elizabeth Clark, and her staff were taking the big day in their stride. She was receiving more than 60 new girls, and they, of course, will remember the occasion all their lives. To the Queen were presented the head girl of the school and of Princess Anne's house. Her Majesty greeted members of the staff and the atmosphere was unaffectedly friendly. So Princess Anne has begun life at school. May the years she will spend there be always pleasantly remembered. A year earlier, Prince Charles had travelled to Scotland with his father, Prince Philip, for the first day of term at his new school, Gordonston. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. There was disbelief when news reached Britain that John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States, had been assassinated in Dallas, Texas. He'd been a great ally to Britain and had offered the world the hope of a bright future. There was a vast wave of sympathy for America and for the President's beautiful widow. From a high window rings out the shot that changes American history. Confusion is indescribable. Both the President and Governor Connolly are hit. While they are rushed to hospitals, swarms of police and FBI men 
Search for the assassin. The police now have the murder gun. On it, they say, a palm print of the man under arrest. He is 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald. Four years ago, he defected to Russia, worked there, and married a Russian. Now the world hears the appalling news. President Kennedy is dead. In a bronze coffin, his body arrives at the airport. Mrs. Kennedy, her dress stained with her husband's blood, rides in the ambulance. It is dark at the White House when the body of Mr. Kennedy is brought back. The saddest homecoming in presidential history. The Pennine Moorlands, scene of one of the most intensive murder hunts of the century. Police and hundreds of volunteers continue their gruesome search for the bodies of murder victims, working on a scant tip-off that the bleak moors hide the evidence of a mass murderer. The discovery of the bodies of two children on the Yorkshire Moors in 1966 led to a massive police investigation. Police and tracker dogs have stepped up the search since the body of 10-year-old Anne Downey was found here. She had been missing since last Boxing Day. Nearby, the hunt also revealed the grave of 12-year-old John Kilbride. More clues were discovered. Tests may prove them to be of vital importance. In May, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were sentenced to life imprisonment for the horrific Moors murders. While the Moorland search continues, police have been probing the mysteries of bloodstains in an unoccupied house near Manchester. An old van discovered in Nottinghamshire may also prove to be a vital clue in the murder hunt. Holidays were precious times in 1960s Britain. Most people still went to the beach to enjoy traditional entertainment such as Punch and Judy or the amusement arcades on the pier. But the traditional bucket and spade resorts were beginning to witness violence. If Brighton did not do record holiday business, it must have been very close to it. That unfailing recipe, sun, sea and the beach, was mixed to perfection. Brighton did not go scot-free. Before the holiday was over, 76 mods and rockers were arrested. For the rest, it was pretty well perfect. Seaside holiday camps were also popular. This is a new game they're trying out at the Clacton Holiday Camp. Not exactly a game of skill, though you do play it on a marked board or sheet. But there are no pieces to play with. You have to use yourself. The arrow tells you where to put your hands and feet, and the idea is to overbalance your opponent. It sounds as complicated as the things that happen when you play it. call it the twister and the makers say it's guaranteed to tie you up in knots. Foreign holidays were becoming cheaper and more popular aided by the rapid growth of air travel. British airlines such as BOAC began to offer cheaper services aimed directly at holiday makers. For many Britons flying was an exciting new experience. For a lucky few a trip to Florida to Disney's theme park became an option. Main Street is the hub of this happy kingdom and Pluto is there to remind you who it was that dreamed up all this color and fun. Not to mention Goofy. Walt Disney's lovable cartoon characters soon became favorites for a new generation of kids. In the 1960s corporate America successfully crossed the Atlantic. For British sports fans, the unforgettable moment of the decade was England's World Cup victory in 1966. There was controversy before a ball was kicked. The Golden Trophy was stolen while being exhibited around the country. It was later discovered by a dog called Pickles, who briefly became a national hero. With victory almost in England's grasp, Germany forced an equaliser, and the game went into extra time. What followed became one of sport's most controversial moments. Goal claimed England. No goal protested the Germans. The referee consulted the linesman who'd been in line with the posts. And goal it was. A few minutes later, the game was over beyond any doubt. Jeff Hurst saw an opening in the defence and achieved the hat-trick. 
Bobby Moore led England up to the Royal Box to receive the Jules Rimet Cup and the winner's medals. To be here as winners of the FA Cup has often been described as the summit of a footballer's ambition. How much greater was the triumph they enjoyed now. Three years ago, Alf Ramsey set out on the hard road that led to the World Cup. Only the optimists thought he could possibly succeed. From celebration to disaster in October 1966, when news of the Aberfan landslide broke, a massive coal slag heap buried a school in the Welsh mining town. In a few minutes, nearly 200 children, happy because they would begin a holiday that afternoon, were engulfed. On the site of the landslide, the task of rescue operated with speed. It looked impossible, it looked hopeless. But these men are miners. Their children were buried in that mud. Mud almost filled the classrooms. With shovels, if necessary, with bare hands, they pitted themselves against the uncounted tons of slimy filth, the waste product of coal mining. Perhaps their little sons and daughters might still be alive. The school lay in the direct path of the disintegrating man-made mountain. In the 60s, four young musicians from Liverpool changed pop music forever. And their screaming fans created a new phenomenon, Beatlemania. They're a natural, these fabulous four, bubbling over with fun, getting as much kick out of entertaining as the fans get from them. George Harrison, Ringo Starr. John Lennon, Paul McCartney. The Beatles were the first British band to achieve massive success simultaneously on both sides of the Atlantic. They launched the British invasion of the American charts. John, Paul, George and Ringo added to the feeling that Britain was the place to be in the 60s. The crowds had waited outside to cheer them all the way to the hotel. No arguing about it, the Beatles are the top pop music phenomenon of the century. There was not much rock music on BBC controlled radio, but kids wanted to hear it, and the demand was met by so-called pirate radio stations. For most of the 1960s, they were a prickly thorn in the side of Britain's mainstream broadcasters. The first of these pirates was Radio Caroline, anchored three miles off the North Sea coast. Caroline Radio is on the air 12 hours a day, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Between those hours, they think, there's a public large enough to attract local advertising revenue. The radio company believe it's all perfectly decent. In the ship's studio, they broadcast with no more concern than if it were all in Broadcasting House. Brace yourself for it and prepare to meet, in some sort of action, a hippie. This is history, all right. This is what they call a love-in. The mid-60s saw the emergence of the hippies in Britain. They dressed in way-out clothes and were into flower power, free love, drugs and groovy music. They believed in free expression and were viewed with dismay, amusement or fear by the British public. They are not all rebels. Some are part-timers, simply trying to meet up with those who have really contracted out of normality. Their rebellion was one of peace and love, but then they began to get involved in protest politics. Their influence, their music and their fashion had a major impact on 60s culture. If the Beatles were the acceptable face of Britain's pop boom, the Rolling Stones were its dark, dangerous side. They represented a voice of contempt for conventional society, and their fans were drifting well away from the philosophy of love and peace. After the death of Brian Jones in 1969, the Rolling Stones gave a famous free concert to more than a quarter of a million of their fans in Hyde Park, London. Some 3,500 white butterflies were released, 
Mick Jagger had read a poem which included the line, he is not dead, in tribute to the young guitarist who had died shortly before in the swimming pool at his home. In the oldest traditions of show business, the show went on. Not everybody understands the youngsters who like this kind of music, but then it wouldn't do if everyone had the same tastes, would it? All right, it's all right for me. Since 1965, American troops have been fighting the communist Viet Cong guerrillas in North Vietnam. By 1968, the war had claimed thousands of American lives. Young people in America and Europe doubted that the war could ever be won and was strongly opposed to continuing American involvement in Southeast Asia. Both sides in this long and escalating war believe that it can be won on the battlefield, though many experts in neutral countries say that in a negotiated settlement lies the best hope of a lasting peace. In the wake of mortar fire and bombs, landing parties moved towards the jungle hideouts of the Viet Cong. And this was only one of many attacks carried out almost daily within 25 miles of Saigon. As the death toll continued to rise, the anti-war protests in Britain became angrier. It started as an anti-Vietnam War demonstration in Trafalgar Square. Vanessa Redgrave, as usual, was in the vanguard of the would-be peacemakers. But also there were troublemakers people not content to just voice their disapproval of the war in Vietnam. And so they marched through the Sunday streets of London to Grosvenor Square and the American Embassy. By the late 60s, the peaceful protests of the hippie movement had all but disappeared. A more radical agenda had evolved. But at the head and in the midst of the advancing column, the hate makers were at work. This was how they turned a demonstration for peace into a bloody riot such as Britain has never before witnessed. Protest was by this time less about alternative lifestyles and more about political goals. Protesters were united against what they saw as the repressive machinery of the state. The air of optimism that had carried Britain through most of the decade was beginning to fade, and protest had become stained with violence. News reports of the time were not always sympathetic, to the protesters. 117 policemen were injured while defending themselves and doing their duty. Only 45 demonstrators were hurt. The police have earned the highest possible praise for their incredible self-control against overwhelming brute force on a day when a demonstration for peace ended as a war in the heart of London. The Mini had been a great success ever since its launch in 1959. Already a design classic, it was a symbol of the strength of manufacturing industry in Britain. Longbridge, a big day for the little one. This is the two millionth mini in company with some of those who helped make the pint-sized people car into an international achievement. So the shiny new addition to the family of minis, complete with a tough guy slogan, joined the lucrative stream of compact autos which begin their career at the factory near Birmingham. It's a career with an assured success, for the Mini is one of the biggest success stories the motor trade has ever known. Certainly the high spot of British motoring history. It's been said they plan to go on making Minis for another ten years. There'll always be customers for the car with the reputation of a giant and the dimensions of a dwarf that's big enough for the whole world. By the late 60s, Britain was leading the development of a new energy revolution. It's in remote places like these throughout Britain that a new type of building is growing up, bringing with it a glimpse of the future. Nuclear power stations will soon be in operation. The electricity generated by them will pour into the grid system to be used by consumers in factories and homes throughout the land. Most of the nuclear power stations are situated on remote, undeveloped coastal sites, in this case Bradwell in Essex. The reason is that an enormous, unlimited supply of cooling water is essential. The design of the power station clearly shows the trend of the future. Fine, open buildings which will provide a major source of the country's electricity in the coming years. In the air, Britain had forged an alliance with France to build Concorde, the supersonic airliner that became an icon. The design of the plane was revolutionary, and Concorde epitomized the mood of optimism that greeted the end of the decade. 
The red, white, and blue of Britain's supersonic jet giants was a proud sight as she made her 22-minute maiden flight to RAF Airford, where the 10,000-foot runway, one of the longest in the country, waited invitingly for the Anglo-French superjet to return to Earth. Gracefully, like a prehistoric winged monster, 002 felt for the ground. This was yet another day of success for the ambitious Anglo-French civil aviation project. The dream of years was a magnificent reality, putting both nations way ahead of the rest of the world and giving glimpses of the speedy 70s which lay ahead. Prince Charles, the 20-year-old heir to the British throne, found himself the centre of the nation's attention at his investiture as Prince of Wales in Carnarvon Castle in July 1969. A modern prince in a medieval castle kneeling before the queen who was fulfilling a promise and giving Wales a worthy prince for its own. In giving to the prince these insignias of office, the queen could not conceal the gentle touch of a mother, despite the formal text of the letter's patent which proclaimed that Charles, Philip, Arthur, George may have the name, style, title, state, dignity and honour of the Principality of Wales and Earldom of Chester. We choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift off on Apollo 11. No story better demonstrates the progress made in the course of the 1960s than this space adventure. At 3.56 a.m. British summer time, Neil Armstrong stepped onto the surface of the moon and finished what Yuri Gagarin had started. The decade ended with the same sense of excitement with which it had begun. Okay, engine stop. Coast control, both autos, he's an engine command override off. Engine arm off. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm um, uh, at the foot of the ladder. I'm gonna step off the land now. That's one small step for me.